Before you can take your blinkers off, you first have to know where they are. In the previous episode, Pollux showed us all one of Zen's blind spots, namely the Monty Python equivalent of the Minimax Horizon effect, which intrinsically affects all Monty Pythons. Being able to spot the problem required expert Go knowledge, but being able to resolve it is going to require expert programming knowledge, pun intended. In chess, the Minimax Horizon dust is easy to sweep away because of the overarching import of capture in chess. So all a chess quiescence checker has to do is follow the lines of on prize swaps. But in Go, capture is less significant, except in the minds of psychopath cues, single-mindedly hell-bent on killing with no thought of their own safety, who are more prevalent online than ever. Still, I'd rather they were sculling around KGS, etc., than doing it for real with live ammo in the ranks of NWO false flag duped crusader nutcases. In Go, the sharp sword is always double-edged. For as one famous old-time pro once said, anyone who can't see in two directions at once has no business playing Go. And never was a truer word spoken. So it's not enough to just check Atari lines. There's more to it than that, which means the Go Monty Python Horizon effect isn't going to go away as easily as the Chess Minimax one did. In her live Go commentaries, Haley constantly mentions looking for Sente, which makes perfect sense if you stop to think about it, for she who leads keeps her leads, as I explained to Godufu in episode 2. Haley learned about Sentai from her own teachers, and they from theirs, going all the way back to Shisaku. Sentai is not something you can afford to not think about. Here, white Q7 certainly looks like Sentai, because if black does not respond, white can push through and ruin black's right side territory. And perhaps Rita also thought it was Sentai, because she blocked. But it may not have been the biggest move on the board, for as Pollux implied, the ruination is maybe not as deep as it looks at first glance. Here is one possible continuation, which shows that White's push-through is worth about 12 points in Fente. Rita was in Byoyomi at the time, and already ahead on the board, so perhaps her prudence was wise. At any rate, she won the game handsomely. There are various Argies in the center, which might be worth more than Q7, which may be what Pollux was thinking of. In the actual game, Rita later played the combination of F9 and F11, which aims at some of those Argies. Anyhow, my Q-like speculations are insignificant. What's more important is what Pollux said. Namely, that although Q7 is Sente, it is easily countered by black blocking at R7, as Rita did. So the only real value of Q7 is as a co-threat. And by playing it before a co-fight starts, Zen is eliminating one of its own future co-threats. So it was an Argy Keshi move. Is Q7 really the best move? It looks like Sente, and Sente surely has to be a central concern of a computer player just as it is for a human player. So how could Zen recognize Sente? That's a really tough problem. One way around a tough problem is to try and bypass it. That's what Bernd Brugman did, and it's worked well so far, up to now. But now we can see that Monty Python has an inherent weakness, which may not be remedied by just more flops. Monty Python is a splendid example of lateral thinking, but I reckon it's now got its feet bogged in a sticky swamp that it'll find hard to climb out of on its own, so it needs some help from an entirely new mountain rescue team. Are you sitting comfortable two square on your body? Then we'll begin. Two, one, zero, all engines running. I leave it to the Matho 
Crescenti to see if they can find a shortcut way to fudge over the issue. All I can think of is to bring back from the dead old ideas that, in my view, never got a good trying out in the first place. Most especially my own old ideas, naturally enough. <laughs> but not just old ideas. There are one or two new ones that can be layered on top. Most particularly, the idea of parallel distributed processes running on networked hardware. That's how Google does it, and it's how Watson did it too. It seems to be plain common sense that it has to be a good idea, especially as there's so much hardware already around that you can rent time on it if you're on a budget. And if you don't even have the budget for that, there are so many peers around that might let you use time on their PCs for free, just so long as they're in on the project. But before getting to that, I need to cover some groundwork first to explain to you why programs like Many Faces and Goliath simply can't compete with Monty Python. There are two basic ways of performing rule-based inference. One is called knee-jerk reaction, which uses opportunistic rules of the form And the other is called considered deduction, which uses deductive rules of the form Knee-jerk reaction and considered deduction are exact opposites. Knee-jerk reaction was the approach taken by Arthur Samuel in 1952, Albert Zobrist in 1960, David Fotland in 1980, and Watson in 2012. Knee-jerk reaction uses surface-level patterns to find candidates and a heuristic to choose between candidates. Watson's heuristic was popularity of the single words its different match searches found, whereas the heuristic game-playing programs use is minimax search of the game tree with a static evaluation function to select which nodes to expand further and to evaluate terminal nodes of the search, whose values are backed up down the tree to assign estimated values of initial candidate moves. This approach has the advantage that it is relatively simple to produce a working program that can play an entire game, which can be improved incrementally by patching in new rules to cover cases where the program is seen to miss a good move in a particular situation. But it also has a fatal weakness. Local events in Go have global effects, so narrowly focused stone patterns cannot deal properly with every situation that matches them. And the number of patches needed to fix up each and every case that is detected is proportional to the size of the complete game tree for Go, which is about 250 to the power of 200. And that's quite a lot. From an AI point of view, knee-jerk reaction is like wriggling around at the very bottom of the well of conceptualization, which means that such a program cannot form a bird's eye view of the situation so it never really knows what it is doing. So we can sum up knee-jerk reaction like this. I don't think, therefore I'm not AI. That's why many faiths doing well in 2004 never had a chance of getting much further up the mountain. So David Fotlan was very wise to dump it when Crazy Stone and Mogo came along and smashed their whirling dervish hobnail boots in many faces face. Animal brains do use opportunistic reasoning knee-jerk reaction in situations like when an attractive stranger hoves into view, but they have another side to their characters, motivation. Motivation is the driving force of triumph. It's what drives men to climb Everest and women to put on makeup, and Alexander Bell to pinch Antonio Mucci's idea and patent it and Alexander the Great to conquer the Eastern world to prove to himself that he was better than he thought his dad thought he was, and Steve Jobs to pinch Xerox Park's idea and commercialize it, and Bill Gates to pinch Steve's idea and relabel it as Windows 3.1. You know the rest. In my view, 
The only fully implemented idea that ever showed any promise was the Reitman-Wilcox program. But in his haste to bring Nemesis to market, I think Bruce made a few too many compromises, so the trail petered out as soon as Monty came along and crushed all before it. But I still think Walter and Bruce were on the right track to start with, the path of knowledge as opposed to brute force. And I think that the path of knowledge is the only path that can help Zen take its next big step up the mountain. Because to recognize Zente, you have to know what it means. And to do that, you have to know what it implies. And to do that, you have to be able to see. But to see what? To see groups, and to see eyes, and territories, so as to be able to see threats to groups and territories. You can't find that out by tossing dice, although there may be a role for Monty in what I'm now calling AHA, which stands for a hierarchy of agents. AHA is the first scratching of a fledgling theory that tries to put together the compatible ideas that Minsky, McCarthy and Hofstadter talked about in episode 25. Chomsky accurately characterizes Watson as a bigger steamroller. But Watson does deploy a principle that partly implements Minsky's society of mind concept, namely parallel processing of multiple methods. Watson uses three different types of search in parallel, single words, syntactic triples, and another one, I forget what it was exactly, and then a kind of static evaluation function, i.e. popularity to choose between the 250 or so candidates its three searches propose. Jeopardy is a one-move game, unlike Go or chess or life in general. And although chess and Go are Markov processes and hence theoretically solvable by hidden Markov models, the size of such a model to be effective is likely to be as impractically large as would an alpha beta search to come anywhere as close to even where Zen is right now. Whereas distributed document search is a simple matter of just carving up the web world into suitable sized URL geography chunks and assigning each servant robot its own chunk to look in, distributed game tree search is tricky because there are overlaps between subspace chunks. Because of these overlaps, chunks need to be hierarchically structured on a dynamic basis because regions of search focus fluctuate from one move to the next and moreover are not spatially divided in the same kind of way that a real world scene is perceived to be. I played a grandmaster at chess, and I'm not a brilliant chess player, it's not my expertise, mathematics yeah. is what I'm good at. Um, uh, so, and we had our brain scanned, an EEG at the same time, and what was happening in my brain, I was using my brain too much, it was sort of, I was trying to think consciously of what was doing, and this grandmaster was well, hardly using any of his brain at all, there was just right. some, some <laughs> part of it, right. but it was almost as if, rather like Ramanujan, he was sort of seeing things going on without having to compute, I was actively sort of using my brain, yeah. which sort of got in the way. Right. Was, and, he, and the guy said, you'll never be a grandmaster, which uh, <laughs> that's fine, you know. Right. But if we scan Philip's brain, it is different. If, excuse yeah. me? If we scan uh, Philip's brain, it is different, structurally different. Um, that, uh, musicians have a larger uh, number of connections between the left and right brain across the corpus callosum. They have an enlarged uh, temporal lobe. Plan and temporal. Ma exactly. Mathematicians have an enlarged area. Now, when you say that, I just want to get a sense. How much data do you have? I mean, how many brains have you studied? <laughs> this is not my data. This is not my data. But, but, but in I, the field, it's well known that when you, uh, when you look at people who have superior skills yeah. um, and, and try and find uh, a basis for that in the brain, there are structural differences. Now, we were talking about functional differences. Uh -huh. And um, uh, this, this relates to many different kinds of skills, um, including taxi drivers. Taxi drivers in London have a bigger hippocampus, posterior hippocampus, which is involved in spatial learning. Huh. Um, so that raises the question, um, do you ha did they have a bigger hippocampus or do you have more connections between your two hemispheres um, because you, uh, of your experience or were you born w with this? And, uh, or some combination of both. Or some combination yeah. of both. And uh, there's, there's a lot of new insight coming into this. Whereas biomimicry is not a design principle of AHA, 
It engineers might benefit from studying what evolution has come up with so far, just as aeronautical engineers are starting to benefit from studying the beautiful mathematics of dragonfly aviation to create drones that are already starting to change the shape of things to come in ways that are terrifying to contemplate, but also full of promise for such onerous tasks as mountain rescue, crop disease management, forest fire stitches in time, and goodness knows what else. Animal visual information processing doesn't work like Sherlock Holmes, who magically sees the whodunit in a single flash of literary inspiration, but more like that of the plodding detective with the shabby raincoat, who spots parts of clues here and there and pieces them together to form tentative hypotheses. The primate brain has a society of mind, as does a heart but there are some key organizational differences as well as a different substrate, i.e. electronic rather than biological. The primate brain is composed of at least six subbrains, each of which is physically fixed in its location. But AHA has an indefinite number of subbrains depending only on the hardware resources available to it. One subbrain is concerned with planning and another with vision. The vision subbrain of AHA looks at fovea sized sub-areas of the board when directed to do so by the planning subbrain to check such things as whether connections are secure or whether there is room to evade and escape and so forth. The vision subbrain has sub-subbrains of its own, specialist modules such as archetype stone pattern matches and goal-directed fovea sized limited region Monty Python searches which performs specific subtasks to resolve higher level deductive rule conditions, things like finding out whether cutting stones can be captured in a gator or ladder. Because such tasks typically require looking wider than the fovea, its focus has to shift around the board. A programming principle I proposed back in 79 is the notion of symbolic generalized moves. None of this is simple to program, but none of it is impossible either. In Haley's commentaries, a few things come up time and time again. Eyes, sente, cuts, nets, and ladders. Gator nets come up all the time, so one kind of agent AHA will need is a gator checker. There's likely to be several gator possibilities in any given game position. So it's easy to see how different agents can be assigned particular gator to explore and report back on. Minsky hypothesizes that just as low-level cognitive processes like emotions overlap, so probably do higher-level ones. Hofstadter suggests that higher-level conceptual processes are powered by analogical reasoning, even if he doesn't like the word reasoning. And random remindings and instantaneous categorization and blends of all sorts are all made of analogies. Might not all of cognition also be made of analogies? That's the cognition core hypothesis. Remember, you heard it first here. Thank you. Analogies are isomorphisms of conceptual structures, which in 1979 I called generalizations. As an example, consider the squeeze to Suji illustrated in Figure 1. This occurs in a race to capture between two eyeless groups. By sacrificing three stones, black can keep ahead in the race and squeeze the life out of white's cutting stones. The generalized move sequence black has comprises a cut, descent, cut of the newly created diagonal, and throw in followed by removal of White's liberties. In the example, the stones at P4 and P3, uh, marked as WS1 in figure 2, are marked as cutting the diagonal connection between the threatened black group in the corner and the strong one on the outside. Q5 and R5, which is WS2, are similarly marked, but they have too many liberties for the squeeze to work. Included among rules for saving threatened groups is the two-stone edge squeeze rule. This rule includes in its condition 
the requirements. Firstly, none of the enemy strings connected to the one to be captured, including those connected by transitivity, has more than three liberties. Secondly, the string to be captured has a cutting point on the second line with the point below it also vacant. And thirdly, the cutting point is unprotected, that is, a cutting stone would not be captured immediately. Whilst there are a few configurations also characterized by these features to which the squeeze to Suji is not appropriate, their testing serves to eliminate countless others. Fitting the aforementioned generalized sequence to the situation in question serves to determine whether and how the original goal can be achieved. In episode 6, we saw an example of a generalization analogy in which the concept of Mi stone placements was generalized to the concept of alternative escape routes. And in episodes 2 and 6, we saw examples of leaning attack feints. Let's choose a nice move for black here. First, let's summarize what we know about the position so far. White is splitting K3 from D4. So we want to strengthen K3, a leaning attack, has a general conceptual structure, which is, given a target T, a group to attack, and a strike force S chosen to attack it, the first thing S has to do is find a secondary target L to lean on or press against, so as to enable S to expand and thereby strengthen itself before either going in for the kill on T or benefiting from the feint if the opponent defends against the indirect attack. Bang! Now S3 has to run into the middle. I agree. Pretty solid move. Follows proverb. Help the weaker group. Around the board, there are going to be lots of T's, and lots of S's for each T, and several L's for each S, so there's another way search can be distributed. Targeted search can be Monty Python but the search area needs to be fovea circumscribed. And to do that, a ha needs to be able to draw a line around a group. It can follow Wilcox and define a group to be strings connected by linkages through a gamer, but as linkages can be sliced apart, their stability needs to be checked. By the way, it looks like KGS's score estimator goes one step further than a gamer, but maybe that's a step too far because a Hoshi stone does not guarantee the corner because the corner is open to invasion at San San. During the Rita Zen match, I had a look to see what SE made of the balance of territory in the middle of the game. And this is what it came up with. <laughs> Bit of work to do there. Each linkage check can be assigned to a different agent so that distributed checking can proceed in parallel. Well, that gives you a glimpse of how a distributed special agent architecture could go about thinking about Go. If you wanted to try to implement it, unless you have as big a budget as IBM, you might do best to do some peer-to-peering with workmates so that the gazillions of flops collectively available to you can be used for cooperation instead of competition like you're all doing right now, you silly Go programmer egoists. Know thyself and know why you do what you do, so you can stop doing it, because there's a much easier way. Well, in theory, there is. This day I'm reading a book uh, by Walter um, Isaacson, uh, The Innovators. Uh, there are lots of uh, detailed uh, uh, stories about how uh, innovations came out. Uh, I guess his point is that innovation come uh, from uh, uh, usually from uh, collective uh, effort from many talented people. I mean, it's important to create an, an environment that uh, fosters innovation, and uh, but you want it to, you want it to let it sort of evolve in a Darwinian way, um, as opposed to sort of pick it ahead. You don't want to have, have, have a sort of hot a high level like a sort of pick a, a technology. Um, and decide the best, best thing that's going to work because it may not be. Um, and you, you know, it's just, you know, it's really, you should really let, let, let things fall. If you, if you don't want to have failure to be too punitive, I mean, well, that's one of the keys to Silicon Valley's success. 
that it's that that's I think a, a really critical thing. Um, if, 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 if you're going to say you want to support innovation and new technology, which is again, you don't know what the path is. There's no map. There's no by its nature is unknown, which means you're going to make false moves. Uh, so you must uh, it must be okay to make false moves. And I sincerely hope that. Uh, uh, our generation can learn from the history and make contributions to uh, the, the next few generations so that they can benefit from our effort. Can we have some of that secret sauce? Can we put it into our education system? Can someone learn from you? It, it is truly amazing what you've done. Oh, thanks. Um, thank you. Well, I, I, I think there, I do think there's a, a, good, a good framework for thinking it is physics, you know, the sort of first principles reasoning. I mean, generally, the, I think there are um, what, what I mean by that is uh, boil things down to the, the, their fundamental truths and reason up from there. I think, I think that's an important thing to do. And then also um, to really pay attention to negative feedback uh, and solicit it, particularly from friends. Um, this may sound like sort of s simple advice, but it's h hardly anyone does that, and, and it's incredibly helpful. Cripes. This one's not much better. Actually, they're Jackson Pollocks. Yeah, I'd agree with you there, sport. That's one small step for AI. One giant leap for me. Or a freier gehen kann. Right in the air, I'm space for maybe I've got speed. Und das sieht gut aus. I've got everything I need. I'm the urban spaceman, baby, I can fly. I'm a supersonic guy. I don't need pleasure, I don't feel pain. If you were to knock me down, I'd just get up again. I'm the urban spaceman, baby, I'm making out. I'm